I want to tell you a story, so please listen carefully because you're going to have to say what you think about the story in just a minute. This is based on a true story from New York City, Manhattan. Prestigious law firm, kind of place that a secretary's desk is bigger than my house. Wall-to-wall carpeting, original impressionist art is hanging in the hallways. Beautiful place. And new lawyer gets hired straight out of one of the top law schools in the country. Top law student, top law school, going to one of the top law firms. As he walks in the first day, the ladies notice him immediately. Very good-looking man. Dresses well, charismatic, obviously brilliant, successful. And the women are talking. You've seen the new lawyer. What do you think of the new lawyer? One woman is very interested. She mentions it to a friend, and the friend says, what are you waiting for? 21st century, you're a successful lawyer. Go for it. So she decides why not. Goes up to him, introduces herself, even more interested. Next day, company lunch, sitting around a conference room table, empty seat beside him. Her friend elbows her into the seat. She sits down, even more interested. A couple days later, she sees him walking down the hallway, going to get a cup of coffee. She decides, I'm going to go for it. Might as well go for it. Goes up to him and asks him out on a date. Basically, extra ticket to a show. Basically, asking him out on a date. He can't go that night. He's busy. But I have a question for the ladies only. Guys, gentlemen, do not answer this question. Ladies only. She's very interested. She tried being forward going after him. It didn't work. She's embarrassed to keep asking. What else can she do? Stalking is not an option. What else can she do? Well, the old standby women have done for thousands of years. She can try and make him jealous, talk to his best friend, send herself flowers. Didn't work. He's not responding. She can play hard to get, right? She ignores him, waits a few days, nothing happens, waits another few days, nothing happens, nothing's working. She's about to move on and give up, but there's something in the back of her mind that wants more information. So maybe today she would just use uh, use Facebook and figure out everybody's ever dated in his whole life and what's going on. Instead, she sends a friend. And the friend's job is to find out what the real story is. Is he interested at all? Is he, is he secretly married? Is he gay? Like, find out what's going on. So she sends the friend to get information. And the lawyer's a smart guy. He understands exactly what the friend is doing. And I want to tell you what he said, because what he said to this friend is fascinating. But before I do, there's one more fact about him I have to share. I told you he was good looking, charismatic, smart. I should also mention that he's black, African American, and she's a white girl. Some women like tall guys, short guys, fat guys, thin guys. She likes black guys. So go back to the story. She went after him, playing, being forward didn't work, playing hard to get, uh, you know, uh, making him jealous. Nothing worked. She sends a friend, listen to what he says to the friend. He says, I'm sorry. I'm sure she's very nice, but I don't date white women. Now, this is a 21st century in New York. Whoa, that is not very politically correct. And there is an uproar in the office. He's only been at the job for a couple weeks, and people are talking, and people are arguing, and some people are very offended. One, goes up, one person goes up to him and says, you're racist. Whites have come a long way. We're finally willing to go out with you, and now you're not willing to go out with us? That's racist. So he's got a big problem, and he realizes that he's got to, like, diffuse the situation, so he apologizes. What he says is, I'm sorry, I didn't phrase it correctly. What I really mean is I'm very into my African-American heritage. I read the literature, I listen to the music, I'm involved in the political movements. This is a big part of my life. And I only want to date and marry somebody that can fully share that identity. And for me, the person has to have black skin in order to understand what it is to be black. Now that's the story now for you. Do you think he's being racist? So it depends how you define it. Technically, I think you can make a claim that he's being racial. I want blacks, not whites, whites, not blacks, Hispanics, not this, Asians, not whatever. But the way that we use the word racist, we use it as a negative. I'm up here and you're down there. I don't want to be friends with you because you're lower than me. I don't work with you because you're lower than me. It's a negative. And in the story, he didn't really say anything negative about white people at all. Now, you can agree or disagree with him. It's a personal thing. But it wasn't really, to my mind at least, it wasn't really racist. It wasn't really negative. For your information, by the way, our tradition, the Jewish tradition, has no problem with different races dating and marrying. Um, It's funny, you know, we were scattered and we are scattered in so many different places that we kind of got a funny idea of what what being Jewish is all about. I grew up in Montreal, Canada. Until I was about 13 or 14 years old, I honestly thought that all Jews had white skin and spoke with Yiddish accents. It's a bit ridiculous as you become more worldly, right? Do you know the majority of Jews in Israel, a statistical majority of Jews in Israel, do not have the classic Caucasian white look? Dark-skinned Iraqi Jews, Yemenite Jews, Persian Jews, Afghani Jews, 100,000 Ethiopian Jews. We are a multiracial, multicultural people. And it, it, religiously, we have no problem with, with different races and you know, cultures dating and marrying. Um, and, and practically, where I live, I live uh, not far from Jerusalem, within a five-minute walk of my house. You know, there's, I know of three biracial couples where there's, you know, one partner was a you know, white-skinned European background, two were African-American converts to Judaism, one's an Ethiopian woman. This is more and more common, more and more beautiful. It doesn't even raise an eyebrow so much. It's a very nice thing. So considering that uh, our religion 
our tradition has no, no problem with the black and white, the, the African-American story. Why do I raise it? Why do I start this, this discussion with that story? Very simple. What we're going to talk about in the next little while is one of the most controversial, sensitive subjects that can be raised. What I want to discuss is intermarrying, intermarriage, mixed marriage, Jews dating and marrying non-Jews. And it, whenever you raise that subject, it sounds terrible. It sounds like you're being racist, like you're being narrow-minded, you're in parochial, you think you're better. It just sounds awful. And it, the discussion can't even start because the whole basis is just, oh my gosh, what if a kind of a person would ever you know, have any comments on it? So I start with this story to make a very simple point. I am not thinking or saying anything bad about anybody. I am actually on record publicly many times. I encourage Protestants to marry Protestants, Catholics to marry Catholics, Muslims to marry Muslims, Hindus to marry Hindus, and yes, Jews to marry other Jews. Not negative, not bad. This is a positive thing for the person. Second word of introduction. When someone converts to Judaism, that's not an intermarriage. That's two Jews marrying. It doesn't matter how you started. When we're talking about intermarriage, Jew marrying a non-Jew, we're talking about one person is Jewish, one person is not Jewish. If they convert, that's two Jews. Now, I'm not ducking the issue. Conversion is a very, very complicated thing. Uh, not a simple subject. Conversion really changes everything. Conversion is not simple, by the way. If I were to give you a million dollars to become a believing Muslim, could you do it? I, I couldn't. Uh, could I fake it? Could I, you know, technically sign on the dotted line and bow down five times a day in order to get a million bucks? Yeah, okay, I could do that. So to come to believe in a tradition that's not your own, that's very rare it's going to happen. It's not a simple thing. Tradition doesn't require everybody to become Jewish. There's six billion, seven billion beautiful people on the planet. But conversion is a serious thing in Judaism. But we're not going to we're not going to get into it at all. It's not my subject. Important subject, not my subject. For now, someone converts to Judaism. That's a Jew. That's not an intermarriage. Not what we're discussing. Third word of introduction. I'm not judging anybody. You shouldn't judge each other. I'm not judging you. It's not our place to judge. According to recent statistics, something like 70% when you're not excluding the Orthodox world, 70% of, uh, of marriages in recent times involve a Jew and a non-Jew, meaning this is, this is the majority of, of the Jewish people now. So it's not our place to say good, bad, you're better. I'm not judging anybody. What we're doing is we're sharing information. Meaning if you had a couple that, God forbid, they couldn't have children, and they're thinking of adopting a child. Beautiful idea. You don't just like adopt a child. You read a book about adoption. You go to a lecture about adoption. It's a subject. It's a phenomenon to understand. That's what we're going we're gonna to do. We're going to share information. What you do with it is up to you. Those are our three words of introduction. We are not being racist, negative, not saying anything bad about anybody, not talking about converts. That changes the equation. And not judging anybody. Okay, let's get into our main subject over here. Let's say you knew in your hometown two people. They were in their late 20s, early 30s. They were both looking for a serious relationship that is going to lead to marriage. I want to emphasize they've never met before. And you have a sense that these two people would hit it off. And you want to play matchmaker. You want to set them up on a blind date. There's only one thing that's making you hesitate. You see, he is a practicing, believing Muslim. Prays five times a day, goes to Mecca, serious, religious, practicing, believing Muslim. And she is a practicing, believing Catholic. Goes to church on Sundays, follows the Pope. Two people, religious, and they're going to stay religious in their respective religions. And you have a sense they would hit it off and they would just, they'd have great chemistry. So would you set them up on a blind date? It's funny, I've asked this question over the years. I started speaking about the subject in uh, 2003. And I wrote a book on the subject called Why Marry Jewish? And the book came out in that year. And then I started speaking about it internationally. So I've asked this question about the Muslim and the Catholic to over 50,000 people. And in every case... Easily over 90% of people say, I would not set up the Muslim and the Catholic. There's always, you know, one guy in the corner, you're saying, yeah, go for it, you know, see the fireworks. Okay, but like most people say, I wouldn't set them up. Again, if you change the variables, everything changes. You say that, oh, they're, they're only 18, they're looking for something casual, they're already in love, they've already met. Okay, that changes things. But in the scenario that I described, in their late 20s or their early 30s, and they're looking to get married and they've never met, most people say, why, why look for problems? You know, this one can find a nice Muslim, this one can find a nice Catholic, like, there's no problem. Like, like why look for trouble? That's fact number one. Most people say that they would not set up the Muslim and the Catholic. Fact number two, do you remember what I quoted before? What percentage of young Jews in the Western world today are marrying non-Jews? Well, depending on the country, depending on the exact year, and depending on where and the background, easily over 50% in almost every Western country. So how does that make sense? On the one hand, yeah, Muslim and Catholic, yeah, they shouldn't, they shouldn't marry each other. On the other hand, yeah, I'll do it. How can the same person say with a straight face, it's wrong for them, go find a Muslim, you stay with a Muslim. Uh, but for me, yeah, I'll marry a non-Jew. The answer is very simple. I focused on the fact that they were religious people, religious Muslim, religious Catholic. 
So it makes perfect sense to say, yeah, if you're religious, you should marry somebody in the same religion. It's going to be much easier for you. Avoid problems. But me, I'm not that religious. I have like a lot of hats that I wear. You know, I'm a woman. I'm a Democrat. I'm a, uh, I'm a cyclist. I'm a vegetarian. Like, you know, there's a whole bunch. I happen to be Jewish. Yeah, it's one of seven or eight, ten things. And okay, it would be nice to share it with my spouse, but I'm not going to share everything with the spouse. So yeah, if you're religious, marrying the same religion. But if, what about if you're not that religious? This, I believe, is the key question facing the Jewish people. Will the Jewish people themselves, will the masses of good, nice, wonderful Jews, will they decide that it's important to them to marry somebody Jewish and, and raise a Jewish family? Is that, is that important? Even if you're not that religious, if you're not that, it's not a big part of who you are. So in order to do this, I want you to imagine a timeline. Is imagine a graph. You have the y-axis, you have the x-axis. And we're, this is a graph that is going to describe, is going to focus on how involved someone is in their religion, culture, nationality, heritage. I'm mixing it all together because it really goes together. How, they are, how involved they are throughout their lives. Meaning, on the vertical axis, what you're going to have is how involved somebody is. Low involvement, middle involvement, high involvement. And going along the bottom, you're going to have age. 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, all the way till death. So I'm going to give you some Jewish examples. And um, this, uh, keep in mind that this is actually based on, uh, on, on straight academic research. There are no absolutes in this, but there's very strong patterns and tendencies, and I want to explore these together. Let's say someone was born in a very religious family and was very religious their entire lives. What would the line look like on the graph? High horizontal line, right? High involvement from birth till death. Let's say someone was born Jewish but never knew they were Jewish, never, never consciously did one Jewish thing their entire lives. What would the timeline look like? Well, lower, low, zero, horizontal line, the entire life never did anything. Let's say someone grows up in a very religious family, but for whatever reasons, bad schooling, parents made mistakes, their own choices, they start dumping religion step by step. What's the line going to look like? Right, negative slope, right? Starts high, goes low. Final example, someone grows up in a family with little um, knowledge of religion, tradition, anything, and as they get older, they get more and more into it. What's the line going to look like? Positive slope, right? Everybody get the idea. That's how the timeline works. And I want you to think, before we share it, you know, here, uh, together, I want you to think, what do you think the, the common timelines are? W what happens to people as they go through life? Certainly the examples that we've shared, you know, there are people who are very into it their entire lives with no exceptions. And there are certainly people who, who drop it. I want to share with you now what the single most common paradigm, most single common timeline is. This, is. this chart is what I call the religious and cultural involvement timeline. And this is how it goes. Most Jewish boys, baby boys, are born on their eighth day of life or shortly thereafter, have a bris milah, a circumcision ceremony. Uh, most girls have a ceremony welcoming to the Jewish community. A uh, tradition is called different things in different communities, simchat bat, brita, make a kiddush, baby naming. Most Jewish kids have some kind of education growing up, some kind of Jewish education. Now, we know that it's not ideal. In a lot of places it could be improved and we really should improve it. Um, but most kids grow up with something. It could be a Sunday school, Saturday morning school, Wednesday afternoon. There's some kind of education grow growing up. Over 80% of Jewish youth in most Western countries have a bar bat mitzvah when they are 12 or 13 years old. In, in, in most cases, you're not just showing up in temple one day and saying, give me presents. I mean, it's actually like a ceremony and you're preparing for it. You prepare a speech, learn with the rabbi, whatever it's going to be. And uh, throughout the years growing up, most families celebrate, you know, many Jewish holidays. Uh, it may be that they celebrate Hanukkah just because they were avoid, avoiding a Christmas influence. But most Jewish kids growing up have some kind of Passover Seder, something on Hanukkah, maybe the high holidays. In other words, when you look at the overall identity of that first period of life, birth to 12, 13, it is relatively high. In some cases, skyrocket. In some cases, nothing. But the typical person is having life cycle events, education, holidays. Like there's something going on. It's a relatively moderate to high religious and cultural involvement. There's a story about a rabbi and a priest taking a walk. And the priest is complaining about mice in his church. He says, Rabbi, have you ever had mice in your synagogue? And the rabbi says, well... You know, I have had mice, but, um, but I got rid of them. And the priest says, wonderful, please tell me your secret. The rabbi says, I don't think my, my solution is going to work for you. Or the priest says, please tell me anyway. The rabbi says, very well, one Saturday morning, got all the mice together in synagogue and gave them bar and bat mitzvahs. They never set foot in synagogue again. It's a funny little joke, but it speaks to a real, a real truth. After bar bat mitzvah, religious cultural involvement plummets. The ceremony is over. Parents got what they wanted. The kids are teenagers. They can rebel. Parents don't want to fight. The parents don't, aren't involved themselves. And people who are involved really go down dramatically. You know, I always ask a university campus on a college campus, you know, what percentage of Jews are involved in Jewish campus life? So obviously it depends what you mean by involved. 
but they've studied it. Hillel.org actually had a, had a study a number of years ago, and it turns out that less than 10% of the Jewish students on a typical college campus in the United States or Canada, it's even worse, by the way, in Europe, in the United States or Canada, less than 10% are involved in, uh, in Jewish campus life in any way, shape, or form. Meaning, if you add up all the people going to Friday night dinner and maybe Israeli lecture and folk dancing and bagel brunch, whatever it's going to be, less than 10%. Meaning, when they were 12 or 13 years old, it was, you know, 80% were highly moderate to high involved in their religion, culture, hair. Did I know it might have been artificial, parents forced it, but it was, it existed. And then, six, seven years later, it's down dramatically. In fact, think about it. If you had to choose a decade, a 10 or maybe 15 year period of a person's life that was on the whole the least religious, where they were least involved, least connected, cared least, did least in terms of their religion, culture, heritage. Which period of, would you say it's like, you know, the uh, elementary school years, the first years, the teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, which 10-year period? So it turns out that on the whole, it's the 20s, starts in the late teens and into the 20s. This is my time for me. I am not in my parents' house where they can force me and tell me what to do. I'm not yet settled in with my family with obligations. I want to explore the world, broaden my horizons, have fun, launch a career. I'm not interested in religion, culture, heritage. I don't want to be tied down by anything. This is my time for me. The first period of life on our timeline, moderate to high involvement. Then, in the mid to late teens, and especially in the 20s, religious cultural involvement usually goes down dramatically. And then something very interesting happens in the 30s. Sometimes it happens in a person's 40s or 50s. Sometimes it happens in the 20s. Sometimes it never happens. But on the whole, in a person's 30s, people start to get re-involved in their religion, culture, heritage. They care more about it, it means more to them, and they get more, re more involved. Why do you think people get re-involved in their religion, culture, heritage? Well, there's a lot of reasons. We don't have time for all of them. Uh, but I'll list to you um, some of the, maybe the top three, or the ones that I think are the most interesting and important for us to discuss. Number one, having children. Having children changes everything. Things that you never cared about start to be so important to you. Things you ran away from, suddenly you start running to. I know a woman from Chicago, Jewish woman, married a non-Jewish fellow, very nice fellow. They moved to a town where there were no Jews. She did nothing Jewish for, for 10 years. No one in the town even knew she was Jewish, aside from her husband. There's no way you would know. No Rosh Hashanah, no Hanukkah, nothing. They have their first child, a boy, and it's a beautiful moment, one of the most beautiful, magical moments of life that I wish for you with the right person in the right time um, the baby is born, the, uh, they wrap up the baby, they weigh it, make sure it's healthy, they bring it back to the mother, not, doctor, nurse, leave the room, and it's that beautiful, magical moment. New mother, new father, new baby, alone together for the first time. We're a family. It's, this is it. This is real. It's wow. So this very nice Jewish lady turns to her very nice non-Jewish husband and says, I'm raising this child to be a Jew. Surprise! It's like, what? You married me? We live here? What? She wasn't a mother then. When you're a parent, things change on a dime. And if they don't change on a dime, they change within the first few years. Boy, it becomes, that's the reason why people get reinvolved. That's the main reason, because of their children. It prompts them, wow, suddenly I'm not alone anymore. I'm not an individual. I'm part of a chain. I have to pass something on. What am I going to give the child? Who are they? Where do I come from? It brings into a whole, brings into reality a whole set of, of just things that are so important and priorities change. That's the number one reason why people get reinvolved. Number two reason why people get reinvolved in their 30s is that after a certain point, like people, rational, normal, intelligent people say, you know what, the parties were fun, enough already. The traveling was interesting, I've been to 42 countries. People settle down, it's a different stage of life, they get it out of their system, they're looking for more, they're looking for community, meaning, spirituality, and so they come home. That's the second reason why people get reinvolved. different stage of life. Third reason, I hope you didn't think of it, God forbid, someone dealing with sickness, death, dying, it brings people home. The Kaddish prayer in our religion, in Judaism, has brought hundreds of thousands or more people closer to their religion, closer to God. So these are the main reasons. They're not the only reasons. They're the main reasons why people get reinvolved. Having children, looking for meaning, spirituality, different stage of life, and dealing with sickness, death, dying. Whatever the reason, the typical person goes through three stages in their religious and cultural involvement. Starts mid to high when they're children, goes down in their late teens, 20s, when they're not really interested, this is my time, and then when they settle down a little bit, have children especially, goes back up. Now here's the key question. In which of these three periods of time does a person choose their spouse? It's the second period. It's the period, obviously for most people, <laughs> it's the second period with people when people are the least involved. People say to me, why do you make such a big deal about interfaith dating and marriage? I've been dating this girl for two years, we get along fine, we live together, we don't have any big problems. You know what my answer is? My answer is, you're 22, you're 25, 
you're 27, you're 19, unless you're ultra-Orthodox, I wouldn't expect there to be any real problems because the challenges of interfaith dating and marriage, the challenges of being together really only happen later. So what have we just discussed? We've basically just discussed two couples. The first couple, religious Muslim, religious Catholic, I think most people agree that like you've never met, like you're not in love, like you can, you can date anybody, like why look for trouble? You can have a much easier connection. You can find a Muslim, like why make problems? Find somebody in your own religion. But how many people are that religious today? Small percentage. This second group is much more important. This is the most, the majority of young Jews today. So the question is, why should somebody who is not that religious be concerned about interfaith dating or marriage? And the answer is very simple. Because how connected a person is to their religion, culture, heritage changes dramatically as they go through life. And usually, when a person is making this decision is when they are, in a sense, the least able to feel that it's an important factor because it doesn't seem to be so important when they're in the 20s. And yet, wow, does it come back and become a real serious issue when you have children, you settle down, you get a little older. The point is, people go through stages. People, there's three stages of religious cultural development. And by the way, without the statistics and the research, I can just give you a visual example of this that you'll be able to identify with. We've never met. I don't know where you're from. But I know exactly who went to your synagogue or temple growing up. And who went there? Well, if you're like 99% of temples and synagogues, you know, around the, uh, around the world, who basically went is you have kids up to bar bat mitzvah, and then you had parents with young kids. That 15 to 30 age rarely showed up in synagogue. Small, why is that? Well, it's been that way for decades and decades and decades. Because the same people who didn't go in their 20s start to go in their 30s when they have kids. The point is, no matter who you are, whether you are religious, less religious, observant, less observant, connected culturally, less... Who you marry matters because how a person feels about the religion, culture, heritage changes drastically as they go through life and especially when they have children and settle down. Notice, by the way, that I haven't actually described what the challenges are. What, what, what are the problems, the challenges, or what are the subjects that we're really talking about? So let's get right into it. Imagine a typical church wedding, middle America, two Christians walking down the aisle about to get married. What percentage of people as they walk down the aisle are in love? I was once speaking in university in a college campus and a student in the back raised his hand, very angry look on his face and said, 10% maximum. It's like, whoa, we need to talk. I mean, most people are in love when they get married, right? I'm not saying it's the deepest level of love. They haven't been married for 20 years yet, but they're in love enough to get married. So what, 90%, 100%, 95%? What's the divorce rate today? Well, in every Western country, with almost no exceptions, it's something like 50%, some places more. So most people have heard that idea that, you know, something like half... Of, um, of modern marriages and divorce happen? Well, it used to be called the, um, you know, the seven-year itch. You know, in baseball, there's a seven-inning uh, seven stretch. So the seven-year itch, meaning that you used to, you know, you do high divorce rates by the seventh year. Now it's not that. Now it's within five. Meaning that of all marriages, a majority are ending in divorce. And of those divorces, over half of them are ending within five years. That's, again, the, the details change in different countries, different groups, but basically it's something like that. Sometimes much worse. So what happened? All these people were in love just a few years ago, and yet tremendously high divorce rates and, and relatively quickly. So the reason is that, well, let me explain it with a story. You might have heard of the uh, pop musician named Billy Joel. Billy Joel is a famous um, pop musician and piano player. So um, he, Billy Joel was once married to a very beautiful, famous woman named Christy Brinkley. They were married for like, you know, four or five years, I don't know exactly, and they got divorced. And I heard an interview with him after they got divorced. And so the, the, the journalist asked him, why did you get divorced? He said, you see, I'm from New York and I love New York and I hate California. And she's from California. She loves California and she hates New York. When we were in New York, I was happy and she was miserable. When we were in California, she was happy and I was miserable. We couldn't find a place to live and geography destroyed our marriage. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that's the real reason they got divorced. None of my business. I don't want to know. But it's a great vignette because it shows us that love is not enough. We like to think love conquers all. Does it actually work? Is it actually true? Well, the divorce rates show it's really not. And the Billy Joel example tries to, it begins to explain why not. Because sometimes practical things can make or break a marriage. Even if a couple did have love, they did have strong feelings. It was real feelings. It was love. But that doesn't mean that marriage is going to work. Meaning love and successful marriage are not synonymous. Everybody starts with love and a huge percentage of marriages are not successful. Um, let me give you another example of it. Let's say you had two people. I'll take gender stereotypes. You could flip it if you want. She 
loved being a kid, loves kids, can't wait to be a mom, it's one of her goals in life. He hated being a kid, hates kids, never wants to have children, plans on going to the doctor's office to make sure, snip, snip, they never actually has children. Could this couple fall in love? Absolutely. Are they destined to have a good marriage? I don't know. On something key like that, boy, that's going to be difficult. The point is, yes, love is important. It's, it's fundamental, but it's not enough to make a marriage work. Maybe for dating, for the first year or two of marriage, that's all you need. Love conquers all. All you need is love. But it's not enough to make a marriage work. And the stats prove that. Very, the divorce rates prove it very clearly. So what do you need? Well, there's a lot of things that you need for marriage to work. You know, there's, there's tons of books on this. Go into a bookshop, you'll see, you know, amazing, you know, uh, you know, bookcases full of books on marriage and relationships. And there's a lot of good information there. You know, you need trust, communication, understanding, respect. All that's obvious. You don't need me for that. You know that. You could read books, write books. I want to share with you one idea that isn't often talked about, but it's what I call, it's crucially important, crucial, practical compatibility. Are these two people on the same page? Are they going in the same direction? Are they going to work together? Let's get down to the main point. All the studies that have been done on interfaith marriages, and they have, the, the, the earliest one that I know of is 1949, Professor Landis. Since then, there have been every couple of years of studies all over the world, all different religions, whether it's a Muslim and a Hindu, it's a Catholic and a Protestant, even two kinds of Christian, but Catholic and a Protestant. It is Jew and non-Jew, whatever it is. Um, you, can, you can Google these names, Dr. Heaton of Brigham Young, Edith Pratt, Larry Bumpus, James Sweet. Uh, there's tons of research on the subject. Um, it shows that when you have two religions in one marriage, chances of problems go up dramatically. Meaning, first universal reason that I encourage people to marry in the same religion, it's better for their marriages. Fewer problems and deeper connection. And let me explain. What do I mean by fewer problems? Very simple. Think about all the challenges. Um, what holidays we're going to celebrate, what community we're going to live in, who our friends are going to be, how we're going to raise our children. It's a myth that people never discuss this when they're dating. They discuss it, but remember, they're not able to discuss it really. Because remember that timeline when people are, you know, when I'm 20 or I'm 25 or I'm 30, and how I feel is very, very different. What do you mean I can't have a Christmas tree? You know, you have Rosh Hashanah, you have Passover Seder, you have Hanukkah. This is my favorite memory growing up. I don't care what I agreed to five years ago. I wasn't a mother then. I wasn't a father then. I can't, I can't be held to that. It's a pretty good question, right? Things change. People change. Agreements don't last. And it becomes challenging. What, all these things add for tension in a marriage. And furthermore, it's not just a question of avoiding problems. It's a question of togetherness. A non-Jewish fellow who's married to a Jewish woman, and he had agreed. He let his wife raise the kids as Jews. He said the following very poetic thing. He said, I felt like a ship, a boat, we're leaving port, going out to sea. My wife and kids were on it, and I wasn't. Meaning, they had this identity together. It was part of who they were, and it wasn't me. Now, you don't have to share everything with your spouse. You know, in an ideal world, maybe, you know, you'd like the same types of food, same movies. Okay, but that's not life. You know, sometimes, fine. He likes French food. She likes Chinese. He likes action. She likes romance. Okay, fine, different. There's a lot of things you have to compromise. It's part of life. That's what marriage is all about, you know? But there's some things so core, so key, including identity, who I am, what my religion is. And when a person gets more, and this is what happens to people, they start to care so much more as they get older and have children, that it's so important to be on the same page. That's the first universal reason that I encourage people to marry in the same faith, whether they're Hindus, Baha'is, Muslims, it's better for the marriages. There's less tension in the marriage, less problems, less fighting, and... There's more togetherness, more understanding. No matter where we go, no matter what we do, more or less, whatever, we're on the same page. We can go there together. Second universal reason. On just about every talk that I give, whether it's college campus or teenagers or 30-somethings, whatever it's going to be on this subject, someone comes up to me after the talk and says, I grew up and I had one parent who was Jewish and one parent who wasn't Jewish. And it was very hard. And I don't want to do that to my kids. I've had Christians come up to me and say, I'm half Catholic and half Protestant. I'm not doing that to my kids. Meaning, one of the greatest gifts you can give to your children is a clear, positive, uncomplicated identity. This is who they are. Not, oh, I'm half Jewish and I'm half Christian, or I'm Jewish, but one of the people I love most in the world, my mother and my father, is not Jewish. It's hard enough to raise a child with a healthy sense of belonging, sense of identity. To add this into them is really hard on children. You know, there's a story of a kid comes home to his father and says, Dad, where do I come from? 
and the father gets very uh, embarrassed and flushed and nervous and spills out the whole, you know, the whole thing about the birds and the bees. And uh, the kid is very, very uh, you know, confused. He says, no, dad, where do I come from? Robert's from France. Where do I come from? Meaning like kids are looking for identity. They want to know who they are. There's a, a, a surveyor, a researcher, once was interviewing children of intermarriage. And he went to this little girl. I don't know exactly how old she was. And uh, he asked her, she was like half uh, Jewish and half not Jewish. One parent was Jewish, one parent wasn't Jewish. And he took her to the side when the parents weren't there. And he said, you know, honey, tell me, tell me honestly, your parents aren't here. Which do you like better, you know, being Jewish or, or, or being Christian? And she said, uh, I like being Christian. Promise you won't tell my daddy? Meaning even kids understand that deep down, the father really would like the wife to be the same religion. The mother would really like. It's a problem and it's hard on kids. So um, this, you don't need the statistics for. There's so many intermarriages around. It's the norm today. I suggest you go around and ask children of intermarriage. In my experience, 9 out of 10 will tell you, you know what? It was kind of hard. I, you know, I can't really be too Jewish because my non-Jewish parent gets offended. I can't really be too this because my Jewish parent gets offended. I'm kind of like not, I never really felt, I'm kind of like not this, not that. Sociologists call it a marginal man. You're kind of like stuck in the middle, not really this, not really that. It's hard on kids. It's not, you know, you figure it out. You know, parents will say, well, I can't figure it out. I can't make a decision. I can't solve this problem. So the kid will, the kid will decide. No, 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 don't mess up a kid and then have them decide. <laughs> like, you, solve the problem yourself. Meaning, there are two universal reasons that I encourage people to marry in the same religion, no matter what the religion is. Better for the marriage, better for the kids. Notice, by the way, that um, there's no guarantees. Um, there's, no, there's no absolutes here. There's some intermarriage that seem to turn out 100% fine, and you can marry another Jew and have a terrible marriage. It happens. We've seen it, right? These are not absolutes. These are not guarantees. But these are very important positive factors to, to, to think about. They're not often talked about, which is why I'm talking about them. And they do work. They are important. Notice that um, both of these are universal. Really, there's very little Jewish that I've said so far in, uh, in our time together. I've used a lot of Jewish you know, references because that's who we are. But the basic ideas, the research, the statistics, the, you know, the, the, um, the timeline, everything like that is very, uh, it's, it's, it's very universal. But Jews are different. And we always have our own you know, way of looking at things. And there has to be a Jewish angle on this, on this subject as well. And it occurred to me a few years ago. It was uh, December time, and I'd been uh, traveling, speaking, uh, giving some lectures, and I was flying back to Israel to spend Hanukkah with my family. And uh, the plane lands, if you've been, you probably recognize what happens. The plane lands at the airport, and the guy gets on the intercom. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to Israel. Thank you for flying. I want to remind you that by Israeli law, you must remain seated with your seatbelts fast until the plane gets to the terminal. That's the thing that they always say. This time, he actually continued. He went on, and he said, uh, seeing as it's the holiday season, the crew would like to share its holiday greetings. To all of you who are seated with your seatbelts fast, and we'd like to wish you a Merry Christmas. And to those of you who are getting up, getting your bags, ignoring the rules as usual, doing whatever the heck you want, we'd like to wish you a Happy Hanukkah. So it's, it's a funny thing, and it's so true. Next time you fly into Israel, notice who's getting up and who's listening, and who's like, you know, Jews don't like rules. We're stubborn people. You know the Torah, the Bible, actually calls us stubborn? It calls us a stiff-necked people. Am Kishorah, stiff-necked. Now, I heard that growing up, I never really knew what it meant. What it means is, I'm going wherever I want to go. I'm not going where you want to the right, I'm not going where you want to the left, I'm not, I'm not listening to anybody. I'm going where, we're stubborn. So, um, being stubborn uh, is, is a bad thing. Um, you know, we don't listen as well as maybe we should. We don't change and improve ourselves as well. Being stubborn also has a good side. You know, we're still here. The Greeks tried to take away our Jewishness. We said, no, we like being Jewish, we want to stay Jewish. And we, were, we stubbornly held on to our Jewishness. The Romans tried to take away our Jewishness. We said, no, we want to stay Jewish. The Christians tried to take it away. No, we want to be Jewish. The early Muslims, no, we want to be Jewish. The Crusaders, the Enlightenment, right? The Russians, the Nazis, everybody's trying to take away our identity. But we said, no, we want to stay Jewish. So here's the question. When you have two Jewish parents today, even in our modern, assimilated, amazing world, when you have two Jewish parents today, the chances that the kid is going to stay identified as a Jew as they grow up are very, very strong. And there's exceptions to every rule, and a kid can do whatever they want. People grow up, they have free choice. But the vast, vast majority of children of, of, uh, of two Jewish parents stay Jewish by all regards, identify as Jews, stay Jews. What happens when you have an interfaith marriage? Meaning, one parent is Jewish, and one parent is not Jewish. Now, statistically, if you look at it, um, you might think, and it'd be reasonable thought, that overall, 50% should stay Jewish. Meaning 50% of the parents are Jewish, 50% of the parents are not Jewish. So look at 10,000 couples, right, you know, and you'll see 50% of the children stay Jewish, 50% not stay Jewish. Well, I wish 50% stay Jewish. I wish it was 40%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%
I wish it was 30%. Just look at like the children, the grandchildren, the descendants of these families. I wish it was 20. I even wish it was 10. You know, it's not exactly clear what percentage do, but I'm going to drop some names here and you can Google these. If you look at American Jewish Re Committee reports, National Jewish Population Surveys from 1991, 2001, Dr. Silverberg Fishel from Brandeis University, Dr. Stephen Cohn from Hebrew University, the Pew study, the Pew Research study, every couple of years is new study coming out. And while the exact details change, depending on who they're studying, how they're studying, you know, what the, uh, you know, what the metrics are, et cetera, but the, the, the universal clarity among all these studies is that a very, very small percentage of the children of intermarriage will stay identified as Jews. I'm not even getting into what is Jew, what isn't Jew. I'm not, I'm not even touching that controversy. I'm just saying, who, who will actually identify as a Jew? Interestingly, very few. And we're talking, I think it's about 5%. That I can't prove to you. But all the stats say it's something like maximum 10, 12, you know what I mean? Like uh, that they stay identified as Jew in any way, shape, or form, even amongst those, even including those. Um, only a minority are saying that their religion is Judaism. Very few celebrate the holidays. Very few visit Israel. Fascinating. What percentage of the children of intermarriage themselves will marry other Jews? Meaning, if one Jewish parent, one non-Jewish parent, you have a child. When that child grows up, will they marry a Jew? So the, the statistics range, something between 8 and 13, 14 percent, depending on who you count, how you count. What that basically means is that if you're looking for the grandchildren of intermarriage, when I, if I marry a non-Jew, will my grandchildren be identified as Jews in any way, shape, or form? Maybe you have a 2% chance, a 3% chance. You want to be really optimistic, a 5% chance? It's, it's not more than that. By the way, you don't even have to be a statistician or look in the dem demographics to understand why this is happening. We're a small minority. In the United States of America, we're less than 2%. And out of those 2%, the majority of those Jews are really not that involved Jewishly, don't know a lot, aren't connected. So, and you're in a big, modern, welcoming, incredible modern culture, right? I mean, there's, there's internet and there's Wi-Fi. It's like, you know, there's openness. You can do anything. Being Jewish is a lifestyle choice. So unless you're strong, like, how are you going to last? I sometimes give the example. Imagine, I don't know if you've ever seen boxing on television, you know, and before the match starts, you know, they're up in the, uh, up in the ring and uh, the two boxers are like, you know, jumping around, getting ready, and the announcer comes in, a microphone comes down from the middle. Ladies and gentlemen, want to present our two fighters in this corner, weighing 500 pounds, the heavyweight champion of the world, Western society. And in this corner, weighing 25 pounds, with two years of Sunday school Jewish education, David. Like, how, how's he going to win? Like, in the Western world, it's not like it was 100 years ago or 200 years ago. You know, a few hundred years ago, um, you didn't really have to do much through most generations. There are exceptions. There were times when Jews assimilated and left. Under the Greeks, it happened, and Spain, and it happened. But, you know, for most of our time in Europe, you know, until a couple hundred years ago, like, you were Jewish automatically. What were you going to do? You were going to cross the street and go into a Russian Orthodox church and convert? I mean, how many people would do that? So e even if you were, like, not that strong a Jew, not that strong a Jewish family, your family stayed Jewish. Today, it's not like that. Today, it is really a challenge to keep your family Jewish. So if the basic building block of identity, my home, is, is not a fully Jewish home, meaning that, well, I'm Jewish, but my spouse isn't Jewish, and we're doing this, but we're also doing that, like, how often is it going to work? Now, I'm not saying it never works. It is not impossible. I know children of intermarriage that turn out to be great Jews. And if you are, if you have a non-Jewish parent and you're Jewish and you're identified as a Jew, wonderful. Stay strong, get stronger, teach, get out to be uh, wonderful. I think it's great. But recognize... For every one that it works, there is a huge number it doesn't. Maximum. It's like, you know, one in ten for children. I don't even think it's that. And by the grandchildren, oh my gosh, it's, it's a small, it's a small, it's almost, it's almost impossible. I mean, it happens occasionally. It's great. Love it. But it's such as, and we understand exactly why. That you're in a big, open, modern world. And you have to be strong. Your identity is formed when you're a child. Who you are, what's important to you. If you thought that this was going to be a talk about, uh, you, know, why, uh, you know, why to marry another Jew, and it was going to be one of those like Jewish guilt things. Notice, like, I haven't said anything about that. There's a story I like about elderly Jewish couple from New York. They retired to Florida, and Sydney and Faggy, and uh, Faggy's in the kitchen. She's cooking, and Sydney walks, walks into the kitchen, puts his head in, starts getting very agitated. Faggy, Faggy, what are you doing? Um, I'm cooking. What are you cooking? What are you cooking? I I'm cooking you eggs. Faggy, Faggy, turn the fire down. Flip the eggs, flip the eggs. Sydney, what's going on? I've been married to you for 50 years. 
I've been cooking eggs for you for 50 years. What are you getting so nervous about? So Sidney puts his arm around his wife, gives her a big peck on the cheek, and says, Feggy, my darling, I just want you to know what it's like driving in a car with you all these years. Meaning, people don't like being told what to do. So if you tell somebody, you should marry another Jew, don't marry out, because, because like, people don't, people are going to react negatively, which is, that's not my approach. I don't think that way, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't speak that way. What have we shared together here? Three reasons. Two reasons are universal. Better for the marriage, better for the kids. Third reason, specifically Jewish, that if I marry a Jew, I have a very strong chance that my family is going to stay Jewish. And this is important to me. If I marry somebody who's not Jewish, no matter what, it's very, very small chance it's going to work. And this is important to me. I'm the link in a chain. This is a beautiful 3,000-year-old religion and tradition. I'm proud of this. I like this. I want my family to know the holidays. I want to be a link in the chain. I don't want to be the one that cuts it off after 3,000 years. I'm not doing it for the rabbis. I'm not doing it for Judaism. I'm not doing it for the Jewish people. I'm doing it for me. This means something to me. Yes, we have, we have an obligation. We're small people. And, and we don't have that many friends, and everyone counts. And there's a responsibility to Jewish history and to our ancestors. That's true, too. But the starting point, the starting point is that this is right for me. So let's summarize. We started out together saying three words of introduction. The first idea, the African-American in the office story, the idea that not being racist, negative, whenever you ra raise a subject like this, it really sounds terrible. So we're, we're getting past that. This is not negative about anybody. This is pro for just for me. And I, I talked to pro Protestants and Catholics and Hindus. All It's basically very, very similar, as you've probably guessed by the end of this talk. Second word of introduction, not talking about converts. Conversion changes everything. I'm not trying to duck the issue. It's an important subject to understand what conversion is, what it is, and how to do it. You know, most Jews today would not even qualify for conversion. It's a long, it's a very serious, hard, long thing. But for our purposes, someone who converts is Jewish. Third word of introduction, not judging. This is the majority of people today. We're just sharing information. You do with it what you want. I just think it's important for people to have information out there because there's a lot of misinformation out there. We then got into the different types of couples, the Muslim and the Catholic. If you remember, if you have a religious Muslim, religious Catholic, and they've never met, and there's plenty of other people they could date. Most people, in my experience, over 90% of people easily say, why, why, why start? Why look for trouble? You know, the last thing, you know, so you're going to fall in love, and then you have all these problems. You know? So it's pretty obvious that you know, the big advantage is to marrying the same faith if you're observant. But what about people who are not that observant, people who are not that religious? So that's when we got to what I think is perhaps the key to understanding this whole subject, what I call the religious and cultural involvement timeline. The idea being that how involved, how much we care what our feelings are and how involved we are in our religion, culture, heritage changes drastically as we go through life. The three reasons that people get reinvolved in their 30s after, you know, the 20s is very often, not everybody, but very often the 20s is a time of like not being so involved, want to, want to get out there, have fun, make a career. I'm not interested in religion, culture, heritage. But then the 30s, three things happen. Having children, different stage of life, settling down, look for meaning, and God forbid, dealing with sickness, death, and dying. The point is that people get reinvolved that who you marry matters, meaning that it's not just a religious couple, it's anybody, that how I feel about my religion, culture, heritage is likely to change, and therefore who I marry matters. We then saw two universal reasons to marry in the same religion, better for the marriage, fewer problems on the one hand, and more of a deep connection, understanding this person gets it. And the second reason is the, the idea of children, meaning the idea that it, it give kids one clear religious identity, one clear cultural identity. This is who they are, and this is, the, this is who their whole family is, meaning their sibling, all their siblings, it's not half this and half that, and they're both their parents, the people they love most in the world. Make it clear, it's a gift to children. Those are two universal reasons. The third reason is specifically Jewish. If I marry somebody Jewish, I have a very high chance my children will stay identified as Jews. If I marry somebody who's not Jewish, there is a very small chance that it's going to work. Not impossible, but it's a very small chance. For more, please visit simpletoremember.com. Handpick Jewish articles, audio, and videos. Only the good stuff. All free. No sign-up.